Hello everybody and welcome to another great variety, this time on Nebbiolo. I am Jimmy Smith, I am the founder and owner of West London Wine School and South London Wine School in London, the United Kingdom and a cool wine bar called Streatham Wine House. This is the advanced version of Nebbiolo. This is ideal for you studying uh, if you are looking at uh, level three and level four of the WSET. If you want something a little bit more straightforward, we do have an intermediate version of Nebbiolo, and that is available uh, and very suitable for level two WSET. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at a few things. First of all, if you have any comments or questions, please do get in touch with at Wine with Jimmy on Instagram or Twitter. And there are the two wine schools and the wine bar, um, which are all found in London. Um, if you are next in London, please do get in touch. Um, please do come for a class or go for a glass at our school or bar, respectively. Cool. So um, there's the websites as well. So let's have a look at the really brilliant grape variety of Nebbiolo, one of the most regal, royal varieties that we have, um, noble varieties that we have in the world. So a little bit of history, first of all, with this classic grape variety. And it has an extensive history, of course, spanning the area of Piemonte and Lombardia. So our kind of north, west and north parts of Italy, centered around areas such as Torino and Milan, so north of Milan and mainly south of Torino. It was first mentioned uh, in um, uh, 1266, so this is 13th century, long time ago, by the Conto de Berto de Balma Rivoli, uh, and the first name there, Nippiol. Uh, so we have, of course, that, that kind of etymological link to what the name is today. Uh, Rivoli is uh, just to the west of Torino, um, so the major sort of capital city of Piemonte. 1295, at the end of the 13th century in Camerano Casasco, which is uh, um, uh, a province which is in between Torino and Alessandria, so therefore towards the east of Torino and the west of Alessandria, it was mentioned and quite close to what its name is today as Nebbiolo, and these are all in documented texts that we have available. Um, start of the 14th century, measured uh, in Canale. And Canale is quite close to Alba. Uh, it's just north of Alba. Uh, so really kind of um, about 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes north of Alba. Uh, and uh, mentioned as Vino Nebbiolo. So once again, exceedingly close in its name. So we've actually got a lot of um, historical texts, therefore, already forming from the 13th and 14th century, dotting it around Piemonte. Um, straight after that in Asti as well, Nebbiolus, which sounds a little bit more Roman in its name, but of course around Asti, which is uh, um, the province which is uh, towards the um, the east of, uh, of Torino and north of Alba. Um, 1324 uh, in Moretta, and Moretta is um, just next to the Roero area, so this is uh, north of uh, key villages like Borolo and Barbaresco and the town of Alba and as Nubliolio, which is a great name. I wish I'd have kept that name, that's wonderful. Um, 1328 in Almezi, which is just west of Torino, is very close to Rivoli, uh, as a Vinum Niboli, uh, so another very important link. And then uh, um, in Bricarazio, uh, which is actually quite far into the west, near the, um, the Monte Viso, which is the mountain ranges. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's really on the sort of foothills of that area. So southwest of Torino, mentioned as Vites de Nebbiolo. So a huge amount of text that really starts to shape the variety coming from around Piemonte. But we will actually learn later that really the genetic diversity, the morphology of it, is that we actually have a significant amount from Piemonte as well as Lombardia uh, with areas such as Valtellina. So... Not only does Nebbiolo have this history behind it, we always have it. We also have a history of alternative grape names of our synonyms. So our first one is Prunent, uh, and this is a very small amount. There is not many people producing this um, this specific clone of Nebbiolo in the Valdossola, which is right in the northern part of Piemonte, on par in latitude with uh, things like the Val d'Aosta, uh, and um, it means, of course, it's a real 
dramatically cool area for Nebbiolo. So that's why there's very little of it. But this specific clone of Prunent um, does actually uh, and is capable of producing a fair decent amount of, uh, of wine in these exceedingly cold conditions for Nebbiolo. Um, in the 15th century, around uh, Vercelli and Novara, um, it was classified as a, a spana, the local name of it. So this is in the famous uh, areas like Gattinara, Gemme, Bocca, Bramatera. Um, so DOCGs and DOCs that are around Novara. Uh, and um, this is along the Sesia River. Uh, so quite a local name. You're seeing um, a lot of transitioning uh, winemakers now using Nebbiolo because it, of course, is much more internationally known. But Spana certainly is a name that you will find it around those areas. At the end of the 16th century, we see it written as Chavanasca, uh, and that is in Valtellina, right in the north of Lombardia uh, on, the, uh, on the Arno River. Uh, and that's that famous area which made absolutely spellbindingly gorgeous wines in these um, steep um, hero type viticultural slopes facing south in the north of the Valtellina area. And then uh, in the 1800s, we find documentation of it, what it's, its name in the Val d'Aosta. Uh, so this is on the Dora Baltea. Uh, river um, as it uh, moves its way down into Piemonte, but this is really around the commune of Donas, where there's a very small amount of it here, but it is locally called Pico Tendro. Um, you won't find it too much on the label, but you can. Uh, so it is a local name of very small production in the very cool area of the Val d'Aosta, uh, of course, in the, in the most southern part of that valley, because of course that is the warmest area as it borders Piemonte. So you can see, therefore, that uh, there are four other quite key great names, uh, synonyms that we find for Nebbiolo that you'll, uh, you'll see. So it's quite important. A little bit of history as well in terms of uh, the influence of um, certain people on the esteem and the high echelon of this variety. Giulia Faletti, um, and this is, as the, the phrase here, Re da Vini, I vino de Rheim, so this is uh, the, the, the grape of kings, the king of grapes. This variety was mentioned that, the king of grapes, the grape of kings, because of um, really Giulio Faletti's work as the Marquise de Barolo um, and putting these wines in front of very famous and important nobility within the house of Savoy. Um, these wines were, and this is when Savoy controlled the Alpine Pass, these wines were, of course, um, immediately loved um, and they were taken up by the House of Savoy that started to then um, sort of ply the area of investment and buy a lot of the wines. So the wines, she's very much well known for putting these wines out there, being a marketeer of, uh, of, of wines like Barolo, for instance, but led with Nebbiolo. So what is Nebbiolo like in the vineyard? Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, um, interesting with all the historical texts, as much as we have, we have a huge amount of old historical texts historical texts from Piemonte, which means that we um, immediately start to think that, of course, its genetic diversity will be much more um, focused around Piemonte. So most people will say, oh, it's from Piemonte. But in fact, um, its genetic diversity when comparing um, what Valtellina has on the Arno River in Lombardia compared to Piemonte, they're actually about the same. So therefore, we think that the area really, you have to use the kind of northern and the western parts of Lombardia uh, and north of Milan, and then combining it with the Val d'Aosta, combining it with northern Piemonte, and then also the Cuneo province, uh, where we find most of it, that whole area really is what we would call the home. So it's not just one region today, but really most of the north and northwest, um, which we would classify as its kind of birthplace and its big genetic diversity. There are quite a few clones. We've actually just talked about Prunent, which is in the Val d'Ossala. Um, we have some others. There is a variety called Nebbiolo Rosé, which has in fact been found to be a completely distinctive genetic grape variety. So that is now no longer classified as a clone. But we have three here, which is mentioned in the Wine Grapes book of Jancis Robinson. And this is Lampia, Miche and Bola. Now, Lampia is the most uh, widespread of the clones, most commonly used. Miche is a virus version of Lampia. 
uh, affected by fan leaf, uh, so it is a different um, clone. And then Bola, and Bola is uh, um, uh, once was quite widespread, but today is less used. It is Lampia, which is the most favoured out of the clones today. And this is really significantly talking about the Cuneo province, where we find, of course, things like Borolo, Babaresco, et al. The variety is early budding, so issues with some frosts are possible, um, and late ripening. It has a dramatically long season, so it therefore requires exceedingly warm sites uh, and favourable, often south-facing sites to, in fact, gain the best amount of character. So you will find that in vineyards, specifically in places like uh, uh, the Cuneo province, so south of Alba, in uh, all the areas around the Lange, uh, Borolos, uh, sorry, Nebbiolo is found on the most favorable sites. This is generally good altitudes, but not too high on, on south facing. Um, all the other great varieties, Barbera, but majorly Dolcetto in this area, will be on more high altitude areas and cooler sites because Nebbiolo needs the most. Um, so it, it is very important that it, it is found on those warmer sites. It also is quite site sensitive um, uh, as well. The, um, the bloom of the grape is very, very foggy, so quite thick skins, um, so therefore fairly decent antho, uh, sorry, th fairly decent phenolic content and tannin, but foggy skins, a big bloomy, and that is the etymology of the grape variety. We call Nebbiolo the foggy grape. Nebbiolo comes from Nebbia, the Italian for fog. We call it that because the grape variety's skin is very bloomy. It is nothing to do with the fog patterns that come into Piemonte. That is climatic. It is exceedingly rare, I think almost completely impossible to find grapes that are um, uh, described after weather patterns. It is normally about how they look, um, what they're like, um, what their skins are like, what their stalks are like, and all these kind of things. Um, so the thick foggy skins are a real reason for it. Um, high in tannins. Now, there's a big ratio of pip content in these small berries of, uh, of Nebbiolo. Uh, and then the thick skins, which are actually low in colour, have a huge amount of tannin in them as well. So it is a remarkably tannic variety. Um, so you can, in fact, when fermenting Nebbiolo, gain huge amounts of tannins. You normally will. Also, catechins, which come from the pips, have to be kind of quite carefully extracted because they can be remarkably bitter and astringent. Low in anthocyanin, so your colour content, that is why Nebbiolo is a very misleading wine to look at. They are very, very pale. They have this kind of look of a Pinot Noir, like an aged Pinot Noir to it. So our mind thinks that the wine that's going to come into our mouth is going to actually be quite gentle and good acidity, but soft tannins. But in fact, it is this kind of enamel stripping acidity and then this kind of gum drying um, assault on your palate, certainly with the younger styles. And then site sensitive. Uh, so it is, a, it is a variety which will be expressed on different sites, um, south facing, southeast facing, southwest facing. You will find actually with aspect, that's quite important. Southwest facing Nebbiolo will often be quite, quite, in, quite intense and, and, and quite dark with its fruits, whereas southeast facing will be that kind of real gentle cherry note. Uh, and much more acidity. Um, so very site sensitive. And we find it on a lot of geology, which is around limestone, things like Tortonian based limestones, Helvetian and others. Now these, uh, the, the different types of limestone here will actually give often different types of wines. And it is why you can get an actual quite uh, approachable Barolo sometimes. And I use approachable like that compared to very long lived because there will be different geological um, foundations uh, behind the wines. Nebbiolo is nearly always on its own, um, certainly in the southern areas of Piemonte around Cuneo and the, the Lange and the Ruero. However, when you go north, Nebbiolo does historically struggle to ripen. So therefore, you will find it blended and you will find it blended with varieties like Vespola, with, um, with things like Uverara, uh, with varieties, uh, other local varieties as well. Uh, so, and even things like Barbera have been used. Um, but these only tend to be up in around Novara, the Vercelli, the Ossola um, area, where it is permitted in the DO, some of the DOCs to blend in these secondary grape varieties. 
Um, wines will be made with quite controlled but extensive oxidative winemaking. This is because the wines are quite rustic, the wines are quite tannic and acidic, and some oxidation will start to counter that and add complexity and a counterpoint against the intensity, often the kind of rustic roughness that you can get with Nebbiolo. So oak is very much mandated behind certain wines like Barbaresco, Barolo, uh, and things like Valtellina and so on. Um, the oak that's used is very much traditionally from Croatia, Northern Croatia from Slavonia. Uh, and these are large neutral casks which are very good at um, oxidating, um, but not adding too much flavor. But of course, French barriques have certainly made a movement into Nebbiolo with people like the Gaia family um, and others that have actually brought in the, a mixture of fermentation and maturation vessels. Um, so you will find some newer, more polished and intense style um, um, Nebbiolos, Barbarescos and Barolos. Bottle aging is extensive and often on top of this um, mandated amount of oak, you will have a mandated amount of bottle aging because the wines need to um, blend and, and sort of form and marry together before they are consumed and sent to the market. Um, so there are definitely laws around this depending on the DOC or DOCG. Um, it is often then widely accepted that, you know, the very best will need decades. Uh, certainly a lot of the very great 90s of, uh, of Barolos and Barbarescos are tasting brilliantly at the minute. Uh, so you are looking, of course, often up to around 30 years, but beyond. I mean, it really is a grape that has great capability of aging. Nebbiolos can sort of uh, key areas then. So Piemonte, and this is the whole of Piemonte, stretching from the Ligurian border in the south to the Aosta Valley sort of area and all the way up to Switzerland. Um, so quite a few areas. There's around uh, 3,700 hectares of Nebbiolo in Piemonte. Uh, most of it is in the Cuneo and Asti areas. So you'll look at Barolo, Lange, Ruero, uh, all those kind of zones. But then, of course, there's many up in the north and you'll see quite a few of these names here. So uh, let's have a look. Um, all of this little collection here. So you'll see Costa de Cesia. The Cesia is the river that this area is uh, sort of uh, on, on the main area. Brama Terra, Lesona, Boca, Geme, and Gatanara, the two Gs, in fact, the great DOCGs here in the north. And then you have things like Cisano and Farra as well. So there's a collection here in the north. Um, and even going further north, there's Osola. Uh, and there's a little bit around Carema, right on the border. Um, some gorgeously fresh styles there on the border of the Val d'Aosta on the river Dora Baltea. Um, so there really is a big style. Now to, to compare those two, the south area, which is all kind of pinkish area around Asti, Alessandria, the gorgeous hot springs of Aquiterme, Alba, these are kind of concentrated, rich, plusher styles, which have very long extensive aging. The northern area, this small collection, of very small DOCs and DOCs, DOCGs, will make fresher, brighter styles, often with some other grapes blended in, for um, more accessible, easier drinking styles. I say easier drinking, they're still very tannic and acidic, but less so than their southern cousins. So a fairly important area, of course, Piemonte, and most people see it as the spiritual home of Nebbiolo. And then across to um, the next area, north of the city of Milan, which is just this map, um, there in the north, in the north, is Valtellina. Uh, Lombardia has just under a thousand hectares under vine, um, and it's all pretty much up here in Valtellina, Valtellina, Valtellina Superiore. This is all DOCG, and including the dried grape uh, appassamento version, Svozato di Valtellina. Uh, so um, the villages are quite important here as well, like Sessella. Um, and uh, the big city here is Sondrio. These wines are quite complex. Uh, for me, they're somewhere in between a northern Piemonte and a southern Piemonte, and there's a, a propensity to be a little bit more rustic with the styles in this area, but uh, they're certainly fantastic wines with capable of long aging. There's a little bit of Nebbiolo in Sardinia. There's a little bit, like I mentioned, in the Val d'Aosta. That's actually on the previous slide. And the Val d'Aosta is where it's called Pico Tendro, around the town of Donas. Uh, so 
quite important, but very, very small in production. And then Nebbiolo really isn't that common anywhere else in the world. There's some of it in Australia. Um, there's little bits in places like uh, California, but it is a very minor grape. And Argentina has a bit as well, but it's quite a minor grape in all of those areas. Um, what it tastes like, uh, it is a haunting variety, one that when you get a great wine, it will stay with you in your memory. Uh, it will stay with you on your palate for quite some time. That's the gorgeous nature of Nebbiolo. They can have this wonderful, long capability, which means you only really have to sip it very slowly to appreciate it. Um, it's great as well because it's not just dark and rich. It will be more red fruited, things like raspberry, strawberries, but cherries and verging with some oxidation on dried raspberry, dried cherry characteristics. Um, it, it can gain very much kind of an earthiness, a rustic note, a mushroom or a truffle character, as in the picture, a spiciness, a tar like character. There's a bit of volatile acid on these wines, rosy characteristics as well, cigar, oak and smoke and leather. It can be really complex, but um, really these are wines you could easily list 30, 40 descriptors on um, because of their massive complexity. Huge tannins, huge acids, quite high alcohols, big bodied wines uh, with primary, secondary and tertiary characteristics and a huge long length, certainly when they've had a bit of time to age. They are uh, remarkably wonderful wines, of course. So. That really is our advanced look at Nebbiolo, which is very useful for those of you studying level two, sorry, level three and level four. It's probably quite a lot for level two, but I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something uh, and thank you for tuning in to the West London Wine School Virtual Online. Uh, my, I've been Jimmy Smith. Um, there is all the personal details at Wine with Jimmy and our schools. But once again, I hope to see you for a class or a glass sometime in the future. Thank you so much.